individual companies and governments lose control of and faith in the internet as a safe place to shop and to learn and to connect. So there's pressure that's built up from all these different stakeholders to provide safe spaces to do something. Governments, companies, and even criminal syndicates begin to build digital fortresses, keeping friends in and dependent on them, and keeping enemies and new voices out. So that's the whole concept of the islands. You've got people who are either in or out, on or off the island, if you'll pardon the reference to television. OK, so what are our drivers? And there, there are probably many more, but these are the ones that we, we really focused in on. The first and most obvious one is national security concerns. We see it every day. Anyone who travels and gets themselves uh, through, through security on their way to an airplane. You've got the explosion of spam, phishing, farming, and cybercrime. And we in the United States don't see it nearly as much as people in some of the other markets in which we work, some of the markets, emerging markets. You think about how difficult it is for us with 90% of all of our email messages being spam. Imagine if you had very limited bandwidth and very limited power and all of this kind of thing. Uh, these, are, these are very, very substantial problems. And they're also very, very, very big problems for, for, for uh, different audiences which are newer to the web, which don't necessarily have the level of web experience that we might. Third of all, economic weakness leads governments to seek revenue through taxation of e-commerce and internet trade preferences. We thought of that in, in light of the current economic crisis, the fact that Spain has 20% unemployment. What if there is an effort to try to take some revenue out of that they say, this is the only growing part of our economy. We need to, we need to do something so that we don't have to, to, to welch on our social promises. Fourth, companies and governments have new tools to learn more about their customers and consumers and exercise more control. We're seeing that around the world. Fifth, content concerns grow with some countries expressing the need to protect and control their culture, society, and way of life. What if there is no French internet? And lastly, growing lawlessness on the web, making it hard to, pr to protect IP. So our end state, very simple. High levels of government control, corporate empires creating walled gardens for safe shopping and surfing, and providing safety on the one hand, but limited choice for consumers on the other. And small companies and emerging economies effect effectively left off the islands. So here's the, we had, a, we had a terrific conversation. We had a relatively smaller group, about 15, 16 people, but everyone is really deeply involved in the conversation, and I was very appreciative of that. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. We had a number of things that came out. We are already, one of the, one of the first things that happened was is that everybody agreed that we're effectively already in an internet island scenario to some meaningful extent. Much more than people think, and that every island claims to be legitimate which is interesting. We think about it from a distance, but every island has a good rationale for its need to be. We clearly want to avoid a tipping point where we go from having some islands to creating an archipelago, where we're all islands, effectively, and we're all disconnected. We identified four basic kinds of islands. The totalitarian island, based on information and citizen control. A liberal island, which might be, on the one hand, trade protectionism, and on the other hand, couched in terms of citizen protection. A corporate island, the idea of keeping your consumers in and getting a higher share of wallet amongst the people who are within your safe zone. And a cultural island, the idea of keeping my, my internet alive, in whatever language that is, assuming that it's not English. We t we, it was in an interesting point that came up was that there is, in fact, a fair amount of trust on the web, and that there's a lot of trust in the private sector on the web, much more so than for government. Even though we know, and we talked about this over in, our, in, our, in our prep con con conversations, that while there's trust for corporations, we also know in our heart of hearts that a lot of corporates have to share information with government. Um, one of the key points that came up, and it, it was a big point of our conversation for about 20 minutes, was the whole role of NGOs. We saw this as critical and increasing, and that, the, that NGOs had a whole series of different roles that they were going to play. The traditional ones, like bearing witness, being the, the group that says, hey, this is, this, is, this is not true, and representing the underrepresented. But also, uh, um, Jeff from AT&T mentioned the idea of, of, of NGOs increasingly serving as a resource for firms and for governments, which I thought was a very interesting point. And last, uh, we all agreed that islands will almost certainly increase the digital divide. So our ideas for the future are our are, are, are suggestions and thoughts. Um, number one, these are clearly problems that cannot be solved by governments or corporations, corporations alone. 
and all will be well served to strengthen the role of civil society. Second of all, focusing on IGF, we want to keep IGF and other parts of the internet governance infrastructure open to all, not government dominated, as there's been some discussion of. And related to that, one of our goals and one of the ways to make it and keep it relevant was to increase participation exponentially by expanding the frequency of events, especially the regional events, which have you know, become much more popular in recent, re in recent months. A another thought was to make the meetings more substantive, more focused on sharing best practices. And this is directly related to our idea of trying to avoid this tipping point with islands. We have models that are out there, new countries that are coming onto the web need to see those, need to see, how, needs to see what their options are so that we can avoid islandization. And lastly, the idea of keeping in internet governance institutions as much as possible as they are. IGF should stay a place for open dialogue, but not a policy or standard-making body. 